All right. Good afternoon, everyone, uh, and welcome to another edition of Fire Law Vlog. Um, this is the first one we've done in a while. You know, I, I start out with the best of intentions of doing them on a regular basis, and it just seems like reality gets in the way sometimes. But um, today's vlog, um, I've got my my good friend Bill Macaron here, and we're going to do um, an update. And I know we've done other updates on the FLSA, but with the change of administration, um, there's already been some changes. The uh, inauguration was less than a week ago. And, um, you know, oh no, I guess it was more than a week ago, no, a week and a half or so. Yeah. Um, but we've got some changes that have already been made. And um, some of those took took effect last week, but uh, some of them are, are still ongoing. And then we also have some thoughts on um, where things may be going in the future. So, um, with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to Bill, and, and this is really Bill's area of expertise. Um, so, um, Bill, why don't you just you know give us give us a sort of an overview, of, you know, what's happened so far and where are we headed? Sure. Good afternoon, and thank you. Uh, it's it's been a busy couple of weeks. It really has. Um, mm -hmm. To start off, one of the first things that uh, President Biden did that first day, I think it was the first day, uh, one of the executive orders that was signed was to stop all um, pending um, changes and regulations across all departments, not just the Department of Labor. And obviously that caused the Department of Labor to even stop some of the things that they were in the process of passing. So that was the thing that happened on day one. So that really, that's something that his executive order on day one put a, put a stop to some of the, the changes that were occurring within the organizations or were said to- Is, is that unusual? Is that unusual no, or is that- No, no. So that's- uh, so that's Exactly, four years ago, President Trump did the same exact thing. Okay. So that, but it, but it goes to show it started on day one. You know, it goes yeah. to show that the that the change in administrations starts on day one. So mm -hmm. day one, that was the first thing that happened. And now since that time, um, last week there were uh, the, the Department of Labor issues opinion letters, and opinion letters basically are the department's official interpretation of the FLSA. So typically, what happens is the employer has a question about how to interpret the FLSA, how to apply the FLSA. They can contact the Department of Labor, ask them for their opinion on it. And there's a lot of reasons why it's a very good idea from an employer's standpoint to get the opinion. What has happened since just in the last week and a half or so um, is that already President Biden has withdrawn three of the opinion letters that were issued shortly after the new year by the uh, by the Trump administration. So there's some moving going on. There's some moving parts that they're um, they're not opinions that really impact firefighters per se, but it does go to show the way that things are changing, things are moving. And they're moving in a, a different direction, uh, you know, from the priorities of the Trump administration at the DOL to reflect now what are going to be President Biden's priorities in his Department of Labor. So that was the initial, you know, the first couple of things that occurred. But then last week, and I'm not sure if it was last Thursday or Friday, it was Friday, last Friday, the Department of Labor um, announced an ending of a program, which in all honesty, I... I wish they didn't end it. They did, but I thought it was not a bad program. I think, I don't know how you felt on it, Kurt. I know we discussed it several times. I thought it was a, a decent program. It was a program the Department of Labor started in 2018. It was called the PAID program, P-A-I-D um, program. And what it basically was, was it was a program where, uh, and I'll use an example, and I got contacted by a fire chief probably about a year ago that had this exact issue. It was a new fire chief. He came into an organization. And he recognized that they weren't, the department wasn't doing things exactly the way they should. It wasn't the end of the world. They weren't, you know, they, they were just, things, things were not right. And there was some issues with the FLSA compliance. So the chief brought it to City Hall. And City Hall had their attorneys look at it. And their attorneys looked at it and realized it was going to be a fairly costly fix. And it was something that nobody wanted to, nobody wanted to take on. It was, the appetite was really not there. And part of the issue was the cost to fix the problem wasn't, outrageous. It was the liquidated damages that are always added on where you're doubling the amount of wages owed. It was the legal fees because you're going to be paying for your legal team plus the, the firefighters legal team. So, you know, to, to if in the event that there was a lawsuit, they basically, they, they want to know part of it. And they said, this is just, it's too costly when you add everything up. Well, what this paid program allowed was it allowed the employer to contact the Department of Labor, more or less raise a flag to say, listen, we're not sure we're doing things correctly here. Um, can you help us? And then what it does is the employer conducted a self audit. They looked at their own books, looked at the way they were paying people, 
filled out some paperwork from the Department of Labor, sent it into the Department of Labor, and the Department of Labor more or less would kind of look at it and say, yeah, you're, you're not doing it correctly. You're, viol you know, you're in violation here and there and, and the next place. But the most important aspect of the program was it allowed the employer to simply pay the employees what was owed, no damages and obviously no legal fees involved. And then the Department of Labor brokered the settlement between the employee and the employer so basically it, it would withstand court you know scrutiny in court if somebody was to was to was to say it wasn't fair and at the end of the day the department in in the example that you know I, I began with would just pay the money that was owed and not be on the hook for damages and not be on the hook you know for, for legal fees so in that that reason, sounds like a win-win bill I you know and let's let's talk about like why why would that be viewed as a negative by the Biden administration, or, well, or can you even it, speculate? It would be speculation, but I think, and in, in this, and in, in that speculation, it would be that the intent of the FLSA was to put a heavy burden on the employer to get it right. And if you don't get it right, there's a there's a price to pay, so to speak, and there's an incentive. So I know the way that the Biden DOL is is you know, in in the press release that accompanied the announcement they were ending the program. It basically it stated that, and I'm trying to remember the exact terminology they used. I kind of chuckled when I read it because it did it read, um, you know, the system didn't get the workers what they were entitled to because the workers once they weren't paid correctly under the FLSA, the worker was entitled to twice the damages, and it didn't do that. So the the Biden administration was looking at this again speculation that this paid system is just another way to cheat. Uh, the employees out of wages that they were rightfully owed. And I have to say, there is no doubt some unscrupulous employers could have looked at it the same way. So I think that's important. And I think it's yeah. important to recognize both sides of that coin. Yeah. And I think, unfortunately, um, for firefighters, um, yeah, you can argue that cities and towns are being uh, unscrupulous. But uh, I think that the, the unscrupulous employers are, are really those... Um, <sighs> The, the big corporations that are really grinding people for minimum wage or just above minimum yeah. wage and, and folks that are making 20, 30 or more dollars an hour, um, you know, maybe there's a 25 cent mistake, 30 cent mistake or, or whatever it may be, um, an hour mistake. But, um, you know, even 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 a dollar an hour, a dollar when you're making 725 an hour and there's a dollar an hour mistake. That's a much bigger percentage than if you're making thirty-five dollars an hour and they make a dollar mistake, and um, sure. you know the consequences. And I, you know, but um, on the public sector side, it would seem to me that the paid program saves the taxpayers money. It doesn't really disadvantage the employees because, as, as I recall about the paid program, um, if the firefighters had already filed suit, you can't use the paid program. Yeah, absolutely, and so, that was one of the that was one of the factors. Yeah. That you couldn't be involved in litigation. They couldn't, you know, and, and, and that was important right. because yeah. I think the example I gave, and I didn't, to be quite honest, I didn't think of that example until I had a, a chief reach out to me with a, yeah. with a, you know, and, and it was great to be able to say, chief, look at this paid program. This mm -hmm. could be a good, a, a good fit for you for this reason. Um, you know, I, and I think that that's on one hand, it's unfortunate that there's the change on the other hand there's going to be change. So I, I guess yeah. you just kind of adapt yeah. to it. You learn, you know, you figure out what the changes are and you adapt to it and move forward. There well, I think, I think when the administration talks about unscrupulous employers or, or alludes to unscrupulous employers and, and getting employees what they want, they're not thinking about taxpayers. Um, they're not thinking about that end of it. So it, it's really unfortunate. And I know we had talked about the paid program in our class and we have another one coming up next week um, on the FLSA. And we, we talked about that as an option, not for every employer, but an option for some employers. If you realize you've made a mistake, this may be an option. You need to get with your city attorney, look at all the facts and make a calculated decision to either go with that or take whatever other steps are appropriate. But now it's kind of like unfortunate that that's taken off the table and it, it disadvantages taxpayers. <laughs> In that respect, it does. You know, it does, and it absolutely. doesn't disadvantage firefighters because if the firefighters had, if they were aware of the mistake and they had already filed suit, they couldn't use the paid program. So the paid program is really only limited to where the employer recognizes they've made a mistake 
and now wants to fix it. Yeah, and I've been I've been contacted, and I get just like you, Kurt. I get contacted mm -hmm. regularly from firefighters, chiefs, some some HR folks, but mm -hmm. I I regularly get contacted by rank and file firefighters that will kind of mm -hmm. give me a hypo to say, is this how this should be done? How should that be done? And I've, I'd be lying if I didn't tell them, advise them strongly. Get, get, sit down with your employer, figure this out. Look at this paid program because yeah. of that exact reason. You, the, the last thing you want to have, if you can avoid it, is a lawsuit because on either side. And I know that sometimes that's hard to explain, especially to um, you know the rank and file firefighters that can think, oh, I can get twice what they owe me. But yeah, let's be but honest, about, at the about end of seven the day, years, <laughs> if exactly, the courts all agree with you. <laughs> exactly, and yeah. at the end of the day. Who's going to ultimately pay for that? Well, next time yeah. there's times that the raises come out for the, you know, it it all comes full circle. Mm -hmm. So there's there's a huge incentive from the employer side to get it right. There's a huge incentive on the employee's side to get it right. So mm -hmm. let's just get together so that it's you, know, you you get it right. And and it is unfortunate that the paid program, you know, uh, bit the dust so to speak, yeah. because uh, there were some things that the Trump DOL uh, did over the last few years. That I personally was thought was not a, I, I, it was not in my opinion good for firefighters, good for the fire service. In all honesty, um, because it it did and it, it almost incentivized employers to do the wrong thing, but the paid program, in my opinion, just wasn't one of those. Yeah, it threw so, the baby out with the bathwater, I guess. Um, that's a with good way to with put that it. one, so. So um, that's that's the biggest change I think that we've seen obviously. And, and it's the headline that hit last Friday. Um, so that would be, you know, the, the biggest change we've seen. There are undoubtedly more coming down the line. You, uh, you, you know, and, and again, I, I'm more of a generalist for the folks out there. I'm more of a generalist. I, I handle all sorts of different aspects of firefighter and fire service um, litigation and lawsuits, but Bill's concentration is really in this wage and hour FLSA area. What are you, what are your thoughts on? I mean, I don't know if you, you know, to speculate as to what's next. Oh, it's moving forward. Yeah. Well, I think you're going to see a lot of like the paid program. Um, mm -hmm. The other, I look at some of the things that the the Trump administration, the DOL under the Trump administration, a couple of things they did. Um, one thing that they did that I was that that irked me. It just for lack of a better term, it just irked me. Typically, when the Department of Labor initiates an investigation and they go in and, and investigate an employer for violating the FLSA, um, so it's not a lawsuit. It's the Department of Labor coming in. They'll mandate, say, you owe everybody, you know, you owe these firefighters twenty thousand dollars in back wages. As a general rule, that twenty thousand is doubled, and mm -hmm. and the employer does owe them, you know, and and there are circumstances where the Department of Labor might not award that. That, that component, but the vast majority of them, that was the, that was the, 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 that was the action moving forward. That's what the FLSA requires. And that's pretty much what happened. I'm going to say nine times out of 10, maybe eight times out of 10. The Trump administration came out with a rule, the Department of Labor rule that stated that those liquidated damages were not the norm anymore. And that following an investigation, just the money damages for the back wages would be acceptable, which to me, in my opinion, just under, undermined the entire undermined the, the entire uh, FLSA because that's that is the point of the FLSA. If you don't follow it, and you know you have whether it's a lawsuit or a DLO investigation, there's penalties, and the penalty is double wages. So that was the first. That was a change that was made later in the in the uh, I'm going to say 2019, maybe even early 2020. That was a policy change at the yeah, Department and no of Labor. There's no basis for that. There's no basis in the FLSA uh, for could, that. In fact, you could argue that the FLSA contradicts that. You know, right. the FLSA is requiring the liquidated. So, yeah. to my knowledge, it's never gone to court. But there's yeah. possible there's, there's a possibility, and I kind of th thought that if that continued, that would be right for a court to invalidate. You know, so the, the the department doing that was, in my mind, in my opinion, outside the scope of what they're what they're allowed to do. Something that this was six years ago or so that Brian Massat, one of the other instructors in the FLSA class uh, had mentioned, and I never thought of, I never thought of it this way. He was really at the 50,000 foot view of things, but when the federal government sets up a, a system, a, a legal system like the FLSA, um, and maybe we can compare it to OSHA, okay? But they come up with a set of laws Okay, which Congress enacts, then they empower a federal agency to come up with regulations and so on. 
someone has to enforce it. And there's really two mechanisms to enforce that the federal government has to enforce laws. One is you can do like OSHA, where you have a federal agency and they come in and they do investigations and they kick butt, they issue citations, they fine you, and they coerce you into complying. So that's that's one model, we'll call it the OSHA model. The DOL did not follow that model when it came to the FLSA. And what they did was they was more of a private enforcement model where someone who felt like they were violated wouldn't go to a federal agency necessarily like the Department of Labor. They could, but they could go to a private attorney and they incentivized the penalties and also the legal fees by saying that if the employer made a mistake, the employer was going to have to pay the employee double damages and also award them attorney's fees. And so I, I know a lot of employers are out there saying, well, why, do, why should we have to pay double damage? And why should we have to pay uh, attorney's fees? Why should, you know, why should that be our obligation? And again, if you go back to the 50,000 foot view that you could either have a system like OSHA, which I think a lot of bureaucratic countries, a lot of European countries, especially, they have a bureaucracy to enforce all of these laws. Whereas I think the FLSA is a really good model in that they've incentivized private attorneys like yourself, like, like Brian Massat, who take FLSA cases and will pursue them for the legal fees and to get double damages for the, for the clients, as opposed to creating this big monstrosity of a bureaucracy to go enforce it. So, you know, just, I, I know sometimes people, um, and when we end up holding the hand of, of different fire departments, um, trying to fix some um, maybe decade old mistakes that have been made in, in terms of their FLSA calculations. Like, well, why do we have to pay double down? Why do we have to pay attorney's fees? Either, either you set it up with this sort of private enforcement model, or you have to go with that bureaucratic enforcement model. And while I think the bureaucratic enforcement model makes a lot of sense when it comes to occupational safety and health, I don't think you could have a private because basically you'd have to have somebody injured. <laughs> um, but uh, it makes a lot of sense in this one. And, yeah. uh, you know, Brian mentioned that it's something that we ought to, we ought to find a way. I, I know we have that four day, four day webinar that we do now chock full of information. I don't know where we'd squeeze in another couple of minutes to discuss it, but I figured I'd, I'd throw it out there now. No, that is an interesting point. And, and also another one of Brian's points, Brian's got a lot of good points. He does. So one he of has Brian's a lot of good points, points that, that, that he's risen before, he's, he's brought it up with me and, and in front of the class as well. The FLSA is not supposed to be easy. And if mm -hmm. you think about it, all of these, everything we're discussing for the most part is all related to overtime. And one mm -hmm. of the purposes of the FLSA was to hire, it was to, to disincentivize working one person 80 hours a week and instead bring in two people each to work 40 hours a week. And of course, you got to remember, this is back in 1938. This is in 1946. This is 1950. So um, health care wasn't, you know, the, the cost of health care wasn't an issue, the cost of pensions, all the reasons. And I know we've all wrestled with these things in the fire service where, well, overtime is cheaper. But if you take that overhead out, if you take the, the, the pension costs, you take the health care costs out, overtime is not cheaper. And that's what this was really in. This was that's what this was based on back in 1938. Bring in another worker. So, yeah. and Brian would argue, this is a pain. This is a pain in the neck. You have to figure this. You have to figure that. Guess what? Hire another dozen firefighters. And then nobody works any overtime. And you don't have any of these headaches. So that's another point that obviously we can't, you know, we don't have the resources to have infinite numbers. But it does make sense when you look at it from that level. Yeah, no, for sure. And, um, you know, I don't know of any fire department that staffs above minimum. I mean, everyone is is like strategically trying not to go above the the max, the the minimum that they need to have on duty. You don't have extra people around, and so as a result, you have fewer firefighters than you actually need, and that's what creates the overtime problem. So, exactly, and sure. it just it, it causes the problems to compound. You know, and just kind of yeah. build build upon each other. But I think uh, back to your your question, trying to think yeah. of of some of the changes if we could predict you know, what we're going to see for the next four years. Um, there is a question whether or not uh, the, uh, in addition to the, 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 um, the, the issue on that uh, liquidated damages for investigations, but there's also a question as to whether or not 
the DOL is going to continue to write opinion letters because at least under the Obama administration, they stopped writing opinion letters. So mm -hmm. there's a possibility you might see the DOL step back from that. I don't get um, that. I, I don't get that. You one know. of the most important, well, and I can see both sides. I, as when I represent employer, and I represent both sides, when I represent an employer, I love, and I will um, align myself and my, my employer's actions with an opinion letter if there's one out there, because mm -hmm. what comes with the opinion letter is a defense. So mm -hmm. the closer you get to that opinion letter, you run the, you know, you have a very good chance or a possibility that if there is a lawsuit, if there is a claim that, you know, you violated the FLSA, you can hold up the letter and you can say, listen, we are exactly like this opinion letter, you know, and you can even petition for an opinion letter and and, and receive that as a defense and not be liable for, even if a, if a, if a court turns around and says, you, you know, you, uh, you violated the FLSA, you can avoid liability if you have that opinion letter. So I think the issue becomes who's writing the opinion, whose facts are going into the letter that goes to the DOL to give the opinion. And I think that that's where it gets tricky because obviously everybody sees things in their own light, everybody, just human nature. You know, there's the old adage, there's three sides to every story, you know, <laughs> side A, side B, and the truth. And usually yeah. it's somewhere in, in the middle. But, um, and I think, so there is a fair amount of um, arguments to be made that the DOL issuing opinion letters is a, is a, uh, a get out of jail free card for, you know, an employer that wants to try to just skirt the, you know, the, the FLSA's requirements. Well, the, the opinion letter can so, be requested by employees as well. We know yeah. IAFF locals have submitted re requests. So I, I understand what you're saying. I, I think that, I, I, I think, unfortunately, and I, I agree that's, that's the assessment of both apparently Obama and now Biden, but um, we don't know. We don't know I, if Biden's going to. There's been nothing on that. Yeah, but, but I think it's unfortunate. I think it's kind of short-sighted because there's a benefit um, so that, you know, uh, particularly in, in other areas where um, we've got to understand that when it comes to the fire service, where if you think about a Venn diagram of all the employees in the United States, uh, you know, relatively few of them, you know, relatively small circle in that Venn diagram are going to be firefighters. And then you have all these little issues that they just don't affect large numbers of people. So as a result, we don't have a lot of cases on it. Yeah. And we well, don't- the opinion is huge. That, that right. opinion could be huge. A absolutely. That that's that's yeah. what I'm talking about. I mean, especially, you know, in those, those areas like on-call time or um, volunteer uh, incentives um, yeah. or other things like marching in parades and all of those different things that they just don't come up. I mean, it doesn't come up for- Coca-Cola or Walmart or a, a lot of the other places that have, you know, tens of thousands of employees or millions of employees in, in a certain uh, profession. So I think, um, I don't know, I, I think it's unfortunate if they if they follow the Obama administration and um, don't issue those opinion letters. So, but before we wrap up, there was one that I, and you and I haven't talked about this, so I'm going to catch a little bit by surprise, but one of your favorite topics is fluctuating work week. And Yes. Uh, the Trump administration had, um, I don't, was it a regulation that they had yeah. come up with? Yeah, it was a 700 series regulation. So, it's advisory. So yeah. you know, again, just to kind of, you know, we, we spent a lot of time in the, in the four-day class getting people up to a level where we can use terms that everybody's going to understand. But do you think about the FLSA uh, as being a law by Congress? Okay, that's, that's really, you know, that's the supreme statutory law that we go by, the FLSA. Then underneath the FLSA, we have a thing called regulations. And regulations are what the Department of Labor enacts, and they are law, but they have to be compliant with the FLSA. And then below regulations, we have opinion letters and administrative rulings and, and different things, guidance that the, the Department of Labor comes out with that are not law. So one of the one of the problem areas um, has been this thing called the fluctuating work week. And, and with that understanding that we're talking about a regulation, not the FLSA, we're talking about a regulation that Department of Labor enacted. Where, where do we stand on that fluctuating work week mess? Well, it's <laughs> it, it, the, you know, the Trump administration made a change to the regulations that control it. And surprisingly, you can't find the fluctuating work week in the FLSA. 
So you're not going to find any reference to a fluctuating work week in that congressional body. Um, however, the Department of Labor has crafted this concept called the, the fluctuating work week. And, and the Supreme Court have, 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 have drafted this or come up with this idea of a fluctu fluctuating work week. Um, the changes that were made were highly detrimental to firefighters. Uh, the changes that were made in January of 2020 um, is, I believe, oh no, actually they were later. The regular rate was January 2020. I think it was later in the year of 2020 that those changes came out for the fluctuating work week. So they've only been in for a couple of months. They've only been, you know, around for a couple of months. They were highly um, detrimental to firefighters, to rank and, rank and file firefighters. Okay, well, t tell us how. Don't just say that, you know, how. Yeah, well, how? most firefighters receive more pay than just your salary. They're not just getting, say, $800 a week for being a firefighter. They're also going to get maybe $500 for longevity pay a year. They're going to get $1,000 for being a paramedic. They're going to get, you know, all these other incentives or which we call wage augments are typically added into a firefighter's pay. Mm -hmm. That's very common. In fact, I think it's mm -hmm. it's fair to say 75, 80% of the, you know, even higher of the firefighters that I've run into, they, yeah, they get something they more. They receive those types of, of wage augments. Historically, if you receive that, you couldn't be paid by the fluctuating work week. Basically, you just, if you got that extra money, even holiday pay, it was, nope, you're not paid a fixed salary because that's one of the requirements for a fluctuating work week. The courts viewed it very strictly. You get paid a fixed salary, and a fixed salary means that's it, 800 bucks a week, whatever it is, nothing extra. And so under the, the fluctuating work folks, week, under the fluctuating work week, if you get $800 a week, whether you work 60 hours a week or 30 hours a week, you get the same rate. You get the 800 bucks and then your, your overtime premium yep. is one half of the regular rate for that particular work week. And okay. the way you come up with that number is you take that weekly salary and divide it by the total number of hours that the person works in that week. So yeah. if you follow the logic, if you work 80 hours in the week and you make 800 bucks, that's $10 an hour. So for every hour between 40 and 80, you're getting $5. Right. If you're so 40 you're hours a week, if you're 53, exactly. it's, you, you've got yeah. a different, you get a different thing. So it, you, you can see where a profession like firefighters who tend to work a lot of extra hours, um, the fluctuating work week would be a big advantage for municipal leaders big disadvantage for firefighters. Okay. Yeah. So, so now they, you know, President Trump, uh, Trump's administration had enacted a regulation that really made it easier for employers to qualify for exactly. the fluctuating, oh, that work, fluctuating week. work week and to utilize it. So there's no doubt that, I mean, that's going to continue to move forward yeah. unless we see a change, unless we see a reverse in course, that would take time because when you think about it, you, you know, in that instance, it's regulations. So you'd have to have a, a formal period of notice and comment. And there's all sorts of, you know, administrative uh, safeguards that take place in order to change something like that. Yeah. The so the DOL couldn't labor, just come out, the DOL couldn't just come out and say, oh, we're not going to enforce that anymore, or we're not, we're, we're going to withdraw that regulation. No, they've got to have a, I shouldn't say, I don't think they can, uh, to my yeah. knowledge. I mean, they couldn't, they couldn't well, just withdraw a regulation that was based in the FLSA. I don't believe right. they could do that. With the they, they'd have to, they have to go through, That's follow the Administrative animal. Procedures Act. And, exactly. uh, and right. So there'd be notice and comment and then they could withdraw it. Exactly. And you got in the, in those, in obviously like the, the notice and comment for the last um, revisions to the fluctuating work week, you had the IFF right in, you know, explaining why they shouldn't make the changes. And you had mm -hmm. the League of Cities and Towns right in saying why they should make the changes. And this is all the stuff that, that the DOL is supposed to kind of take into consideration when they make those kind of changes. Yeah. Um, but then that's, oh. that's, 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 that's one. I don't know if we're going to see a huge change in that initially. I wouldn't be surprised if that doesn't occur. Well, I would eventually. think the IFF is, it should be all over that one. But. Well, I'm sure they, and I'm sure they will be. Like, again, it'll take a little bit of time to, um, for that one to shake out. I think you could see some changes in the regular rate. Um, there were some changes pushed through back about a year ago by the, mm -hmm. by the, uh, the, the Trump DOL and the regular rate that also disadvantaged a lot of firefighters. Yeah. There yeah. was also um, executive exemption. I think, I think we'd be crazy to think just because of the topic, um, I believe that the Biden administration is going to take another swing at raising the salary level for exempt employees, just mm -hmm. because I think the way that happened last time left such a bad taste in at least the the, the Obama administration DOL 
I think that uh, it, it's fair to say you're going to see them come back to try to raise the uh, the sal salary yeah. level. And what is this? Executive. The salary used to be was it used to be four forty five. Yeah, four forty five. And, and then, then Obama it, went wanted to bring it to nine thirteen. I believe was the yeah, number. But it didn't. And it ended it up settling at six. Shoot. Six forty. Six forty. Six forty. Six forty. Yeah. yeah Six fifty four. Right some something in there. It's about thirty thousand a year. About thirty. Yeah. About, yeah, about thirty thousand a year. So. Which is fine if you're working at McDonald's or you know a uh, fast food restaurant uh, and you're the manager, but um, you know if you're gonna you're gonna be an exempt executive, it leaves me scratching my head that somebody would be an exempt executive at thirty thousand a year. That's yeah. that's like intern pay. <laughs> yeah. so. No, it is, and and again, it was. I, I think it's. And I do think that when you look to see the, what the Obama DOL tried to do, you know, five years ago or so. Um, mm -hmm. was a big reach. It was a big reach and it got struck down. Mm -hmm. And I, I would be highly surprised if, if um, at some point over the next four years mm -hmm. that the, uh, the Biden administration doesn't try to revisit that. And um, in particular, I mean, I think we'll get, I don't want to get too much detail, but there was under the Obama, regula uh, the Obama regulation there, they wanted there to be um, automatic updates every three years. So look oh, at yeah. the, you know, yeah. look at the, look at the uh, consumer price index, a bunch of different factors and kind of tick it up a little bit every three years, which I personally think makes sense. As long as you're transparent about it and give employers mm -hmm. plenty of time to, to, to be, you know, apprised of it and make the adjustment. I think that makes sense because again, that, that regulation stood at $455 a week for how long? Yeah. So just, just a couple of years ago, we were, you could be an exempt executive making 25,000 a year. So you know, I I do think that that's a uh, that's going to be right for uh, for some change as well. Yeah, we know he, he's already proposed fifteen dollars an hour nationwide for minimum wage, which uh, is over twice what it is now, seven twenty five right now. So, yeah, yeah. Now that's and, and it'll be it'll be interesting to see how that's met with you know yeah. obviously that sort of that, that's a that's a change you know that would have to the Congress would would have to you know enact mm -hmm. that sort of a, of a change. That's not something that DOL can do on their own. All right. Well, um, we've been going now for, I'm not, I can't even see my, my uh, timing here. I'm going for about a half about hour here. Yeah, yeah, about 30 minutes. So uh, you want, you have any, any final comments uh, wrapping no, us up? I think, I think it's going to be an interesting ride. <laughs> I think it is. I think it's going to be a lot of, you know, up and down. Um, I think a lot of some of the changes that were made, in the Trump administration and that are still in effect now. And that's mm -hmm. part of what's going to be difficult. Employers are still going to be responsible. So there's this de degree of, you know, back and forth between mm -hmm. what's allowable and what's not. So um, I, I do think there's, it's, it's going to be, it's going to be an interesting ride. Yeah. All right. Well, um, we've got our FLSA class coming up next week. Uh, still plenty of room there. So if anybody's interested and, you know, this is, you know, it, it's not, I was, I was talking to my, um, the, the folks in my books are now published by uh, Penwell Publishing Fire Engineering. And I was talking to them about the next edition and, and the difference of, of my book compared to maybe some of the other books out there. Um, but the law is evolving. It, it's not static. You know, you think about building construction is, you know, there's, there's some new techniques and different things or uh, tactics, you know, there's some new things, but the law is constantly evolving and the FLSA is no different. Um, you know, it, I mean, it's so important, uh, not just to the fire service, but many, many industries and it is evolving. So, you know, folks who um, have been to the class maybe two or three years ago, there's a lot of changes uh, that happen over the course of two or three years. There's a lot that has happened in the last two weeks. Um, that we've got to kind of bring folks up to speed on. So, um, but at any rate, um, we'll leave a link to that if anybody's interested in coming, hope to see you. And that's gonna wrap it up for another edition of Fire Law Vlog.